So uh, this is a talk called, called Simple Questions Should Have Simple Answers. And um, this all kind of came about um, because I do a thing called Pearl5i, um, which is Pearl5 improved. And uh, you know, so I'm a Pearl programmer, and I like to, um, I really like Pearl, but development can be really slow. Um, so I got annoyed with not being able to do be simple things being difficult. And uh, a, an example that I have here is, how do I touch a file? How do I um, create the file that doesn't exist and update its modified time, right? Do it all the time. You have a Unix command for it. There's no touch function in Perl. Um, so the answer to that is, well, you, you can open the file for appending. And right there, like the way you open files in Perl is weird, and you have to understand that. Um, that, that uh, uh, the arrow means appending, double arrow means appending syntax. Um, and then you call the uTime function, which of course is the function that modifies the modified time on a file. So it's called, of course, uTime. I actually don't know. Does anybody know why it's called uTime? It's called uTime in like every language. Ah, so like so 40 years later, we're still calling it that. Great. Um, What's that? Use update time or update time? Update time. There you go. All right. See, now I know. Um, so, and then, of course, you have to do your exception handling um, that I can't even be arsed to write all of it out. Um, and then, uh, what, but what if the directory that the file is in doesn't exist? Oh, OK. So to do that, you've got to load these modules and get the parent directory. Oh, damn. Sorry. My computer really likes to ask my uh, login pa password, and it will not let me do anything until it gets it. OK, so you've got to like, load some modules to pull in basic file operations, like what is the parent directory of this file? Um, I want to make uh, this directory, and then you do the open stuff. Oh, and don't forget the error handling. <laughs> um, so uh, like all I want to do is, is just touch a file. Um, so here's how you do it in Pro 5i, at least next, next major release, is that. Um, you have a string as a file, you get a path object out of it, and you call touch path, and it just takes care of it all for you. And even touch path is written better than the, the, the way that you're supposed to do it by hand, because it kind of recursively solves a bunch of small problems by making them simpler and simpler. Um, little things that are not built in are now method calls on, on file objects. Um, <laughs> Perl is not the only language to have this problem. I looked it up for, uh, uh, on Stack Overflow. The Python uh, question on this has s seven answers, one of which is in C. <laughs> <laughs> and most of them have some sort of race conditions. And the accepted highest voted answer is a full page with two implementations. So it's like, ah, why, what, like what is the resistance to adding simple, simple, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, uh, functions that people do all the time, that other people think are trivial. So um, we have a simple question and a simple answer, right? That's what I want, simple question, simple answer. And this was, like, I've been doing Pro, Pro 5i for like three years. And I just, in the last, in, uh, uh, right around the time that open source bridge submissions happened, I had this kind of value distillation where I realized that this is sort of what I've been doing for a long time, was, was taking, taking simple questions from the point of the view of the user and giving them and creating the simple answer. And it, it's sort of become a, a, a more a, a value or a philosophy, and it's had deep effects on the rest of the project and how I kind of look at uh, design and bug reports and APIs. Now, I got scooped by Rich Hickey. Uh, who gave a wonderful talk called Simple Made Easy. Um, Rich Hickey, uh, uh, he wrote Closure. Um, closure. Uh, and uh, this talk is really interesting. I would recommend looking for it. If you just look up Rich Hickey, Simple Made Easy, you can find his slides and a video of him talking about it. The takeaway that I took from it was that he decided to define simple and easy. And you may have quibbles with how he defines it, but the fact that he defines it is really important. So first of all, he talks about simple. And simple is something that has uh, no moving parts. It's just one unit. It's one thing. Uh, he talks about the derivation of it of, uh, from the Latin, where simple is simplex is one braid. 
you know, you take one rope and you're braiding it with itself. Well, that's not a braid, that's just a thing. Complex is you're taking, you know, multiple things and twirling them all together. So simple means it does, it can do a lot of things. You mean it does, it does one thing, it has one moving part, uh, there is, you know, it has one purpose. And this is sort of the Unix, supposedly the Unix tool philosophy, even though we oftentimes get it very wrong. Um, so simple is about the number of moving parts. Um, however, simple is layered. Simple, a simple thing from, uh, from, from, from one perspective can actually be very, very complex on the inside. You know, uh, you, you go into your car, you turn the key, and you step on the gas. That's simple um, from the user's perspective, but it's very, very complex uh, in, in, in implementation. Um, so, and there's also, you know, a simple answer like, I need to go get some milk. We'll go drive to the store. That may seem simple, but really there's a huge complex prerequisite there, which is, how do I drive? <laughs> um, and a lot of times that gets, that gets lost. Um, so a simple answer can have complex prerequisites, can have complex implementation. Did you say eggs and milk or XML? Milk. <laughs> Actually said eczema. <laughs> yeah. Um, so easy. Easy is, um, uh, 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 well, he defines it in a bunch of different ways, but easy is the more what we kind of confuse with simple. Easy, he, is interesting, he says near at hand, going back to a sort of bogus derivation of the, of the word, but whatever. Near at hand. These are things that I already understand that are around me that I can just use immediately. So for example, I'm a Perl programmer, and Perl, I've been doing it for 15 years, so Perl, doing something in Perl is easy. Um, you know, I would rather write up a Perl script to do webby stuff than say use if this then else, oh, no, if this then that or some sort of, you know, RSS piping kind of thing. I don't even, can't even talk about it intelligently. It's how little I know about it. So um, easy is very relative. Easy matters about who the audience is and who is doing it. Um, uh, and simple is not necessarily easy. Um, for example, anybody here a Lisp programmer? Yeah, Lisp is simple. Grammatically simple, you know, the, the, the whole parenthesis or defining the grammar and everything else, but it's not easy. It's not easy. So just because it only has a few moving parts does not make it easy. Um, you know, if, if you want to take a more uh, uh, philosophical point of view, you know, some of the simple philosophies uh, can actually be very, very, very difficult to implement in a modern society or, or even, you know, in a not modern society. Um, you know, if, uh, it, well, monks, you can figure it out. <laughs> um, and the flip side is the same thing. Easy is not necessarily simple. Uh, so, for example, here, um, in, uh, if anybody here ever tried to install a Pro module and failed, the CPAN problem. Yeah, okay, plenty of people. So, uh, Pro5i requires a huge dependency tree, like 50 some odd modules. Um, and so, every time I would be wanting to teach somebody Perl, the first thing I go is, oh, this would be so much easier in Perl 5i. Um, now, oh, I have to teach, I have to configure your CPAN installation. Uh, let's, just, let's just hack it together in regular Perl, forget it. Uh, or let's use Ruby or something else. So um, I took a, a page from Octopress, um, and I was just like, well, what, what can I just cut and paste into, into a terminal to uh, configure CPAN and install Perl 5i? And I dis dis distilled it down to this. And this is not simple, it has a lot of moving parts, but it is easy because if you're on, if you're on a well-behaved Unix, you can just cut and paste this into your terminal and go. Um, and we have a Windows version as well. Uh, um, so, and from an experienced developer's point of view, this is useless because I've already done all that part and all I care about is this little bit here. Um, uh, but once you do this, once you have CPAN installed and you've done that prerequisite, now everything, a lot of things become simpler and easier. This is that complex prerequisite that can make other things simple. Now the answer to a lot of things can be just install this CPAN module, or just, just install this Pro module. So I, I started with this title, Simple Questions Have Simple Answers, but really after watching, this is what I submitted, and then I watched Rick, Rich Hickey's talk. Everybody's like, did you see the talk about, by Rich Hickey? So I was like, well, it really a simple question should have simple and easy answers 
And I spent a lot of time on, on working out the font stuff on this, but then I realized I, I, you might need a little bit of, of help to figure out how exactly that should be read. And then as soon as you start drawing lines over something that's supposedly easy, um, it's, that's a red flag to say that it's not easy and you're in this place. Um, uh, if you have to put directions on it, it really could be easier. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so it's really a simple question. You should have simple and easy answers uh, because they are two distinct things. Um, and once you kind of adopt that, that philosophy, there are a lot of consequences, uh, good consequences, but there are also uh, things that you can do to your project to make this possible. Um, uh, you know, what, what might be blocking you from giving the simple questions simple answers? So uh, basically the rest of the talk is going to be a smattering of that. Um, I had a lot of trouble coming up with a story for this talk, and I really don't have one. So, um, uh, uh, so I'll just plow ahead. Um, one of, the, one of the, the corollaries that came out of this is that in a lot of cases, um, you, the user has to choose between being convenient and correct, one or the other. Um, so, you know, either I can do it in one line or two lines, or, or you know, I can use the easy um, uh, website or whatever else. But there's going to be problems with that. You know, in a programming language, maybe I'm not doing all the error checking I should. Maybe there's a rate condition. Um, um, in a, in a, on the other side, maybe there's like privacy concerns. Maybe there's um, uh, you know uh, issues with uh, its reliability. Who knows what? So the corollary to this, the philosophy is that users shouldn't have to make that decision. The, as much as possible you should not have to decide between convenience and correct, being convenient and being correct. The most convenient way should also be the most correct way. And if you want to do it in some less, I won't say less correct, but I'll say um, more edge casey way. Because a lot of times uh, 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 the, the way that's convenient will have um, no, convenient, no, no correctness in it whatsoever because they couldn't decide which one of the three correct ways would they wanted to make correct. So, um, if, yeah, uh, so if you want to do it more edge casey way, that should be the less convenient way. Or if you want to do it the wrong way, it should be the less convenient way. There's an additional corollary on the corollary, which is uh, that. Um, you also don't want the user to have to um, uh, choose between being convenience correct and efficient. Uh, I like to say pick three. Um, not always possible, but, but a goal. Uh, uh, so instead of, instead of saying, you know, convenience correct and efficient, pick two. I say pick three. And then we'll see which one we might have to scale back on a little bit um, uh, to make it work. So it, it's sort of a, a design optimism uh, point of view. So for example, um, if anybody, again, if anybody's done pro programming, you have to unpack your arguments, which is ridiculous. Um, and this is, this is another example of not being able to choose between convenience and cor cor uh, uh, which convenient and correct way are we going to pick because everybody hates this in Perl and nobody can decide on what the, um, the syntax should be. Um, oh, and <laughs> I forgot the error checking, um, which is what everybody does, because like this is convenient, this is correct, and that sucks. So now you've got to decide between one and the other. Um, so uh, there, there are several module pro libraries out there which will give you this syntax, and that literally compiles down to that. Um, so it is both convenient and correct and efficient. Uh, because it is it's just doing exactly what you, uh, what you would have done if you were doing it uh, on your own. And it's interesting how many people just thought this was impossible. Um, that it was just going, but how many people still look at that and go, oh, it's going to be slower. Um, so you can do it if you just decide it's not impossible. Uh, the other thing we started to do was <laughs> um, we had a metric in Pro 5i um, to simple, simple questions. How do I have a thing? Is it a number? What kind of number is it? Simple question from the point of view of the user, right? Um, but as a programmer, especially if, if you know, it's just a string, it's like, well, that can be kind of complicated. And uh, one of the metrics we used was, this is a Perl fact question. How complicated is the answer? And how long is the answer? So complicated in the sense of how many moving parts does it have? And, and, uh, and just sheer volume. Uh, so simple question, and here is the answer. 
cut and paste this into your code with all these regular expressions and everything. I found bugs in these. It was great when I was, when I was doing this. Um, uh, uh, oh, and, and by the way, here's another way to do it with a big wall of text. And, um, and here's another way to do it if you're on a POSIX system. And, and there's a CPAN module that can do it. So it's like, dear God. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you have to understand, like, if, if you understand how scanf works in C, this is a good one. Um, here's the, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. From other, uh, yeah. So that well, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment about about how these things rot. Um, uh, so here is our answer. Um, uh, if you want to know if it's a number, you call the is number method. Is a positive number, you call the is positive method. Is an integer, you call the is integer method, and so on and so forth. We just take care of it all. Um, and it's doing the same. Well, actually, it doesn't. It, I, don't, I don't know. It's doing the same thing under the hood as as it was in the fact it originally was. Um, and the great part about this is, first of all, it's like well. Your question is, is it a number? Well, you call the is number method. Um, they're a simple question, simple answer. And also, it has a, um, uh, they line up. Uh, so is it a number? Call the is number method. There's a, a mapping, a natural mapping from one to the other. Um, and then, because we packed everything inside methods and hidden, hidden the implementation away, we can fix things like whatever Nick was talking about, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, the, 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 the special thing in Perl where if it's tied and who knows what's going to happen. Um, is there an isPrime method? Oh, so that came up in Perl 6, actually, <laughs> in a discussion. Yes, apparently there is an isPrime method. And the, and the complaint was, and this is going to come up when we talk about flying camels later. Um, remind me when we come, we'll come up with flying camels. I'll talk about the problems with the isPrime. I thought, I think isPrime is a good idea, but there are, are issues with it. Issue. Yeah. So, okay, uh, <laughs> next one. So the next philosophy is, is this, uh, what is your default? Is your default, um, when somebody says, hey, I want to add you know, a, a method to, to uh, uh, determine if something is a number, because I do it all the time and it's a pain in the ass, is the, is the uh, answer yes or no? Is the default yes or no? And usually, in a lot of projects, the answer is no. Like, you have to justify this and why this is worth the time and the effort and blah, 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 blah. Um, so the, the simple question, simple answer philosophy says, OK, we have to switch our default to yes. Um, once you have said, hey, this, is a, this could be simpler, um, you kind of go, well, OK, until we, can, in, un, until we can think of a reason why we really shouldn't do this, sure, why not? Uh, and it, it, it makes development so much more fun uh, when you don't have to uh, uh, fight for, to get convenience and correctness out of your project. Um, but it has consequences. Um, so so uh, here's a question. Um, why would the default be no? I have things to, to hand out slash throw at people. Code bloat. Code bloat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Low quality code. What? Low quality code. Low quality code, OK. Back doors. Back doors. Have it to it. Performance? Yeah, efficiency and performance. All right, let's try not to kill anybody. No tests. What I hear? That's, I have that actually on the slide. No tests. One more. Who wants a round to it? I don't want to think about that right now. Wait, you don't want to? Oh, it's actually your thing? You already got one. Did you already get one? No. Okay. Cool. Um, what was the other one? Yeah, yeah, okay. You, you can flinch as I pretend to throw one at you. Okay. Um, right, so you're an excellent audience because you played right into my, my hands. Every single one of those are all developer centric. Um, uh, <laughs> they're all developer centric questions. Uh, sorry, answers. It's all, about, it's all about how hard is it to develop and how, hard, how, how much maintenance it might be and you know, slow down the tests and all these other things. I don't think I heard a single one. Maybe I missed it while I was throwing things at the audience. That hurts the user. Backdoors kind of hurts the user, but sure. <laughs> security, <laughs> security holes, yeah. Um, ah, but that's solvable. Okay. That's solvable. The API bloat, like, like, but that's good. So that was good, like drilling into API bloat is kind of a, you can't really work with that. But like, uh, the, the issue under, underlying it is, how do I find stuff? Yeah, and that's, that's uh, really good. Or say if you're like, you know, memory image size, if that's a concern to you. Um, that's something you can work with. 
So, um, so yeah, the first thing to realize, and Rich Hickey hammers on this, is um, it's really all, a lot of, most of the time, it's all about the developers. Like, it's really, really developer-centric as to whether or not you choose to do something simple or easy, have a simple or easy answer. And um, to be a more enlightened developer, you kind of have to realize this, this strong tendency, uh, especially in a group of developers who are answering user problems, to think about development, right? It's natural. And uh, uh, a, a way to think about enlightenment is to say, well, I know what the natural thing to do. I know what my impulses are going to be. And I am going to realize that, and I'm going to take action, which is not simply on instinct, on impulse, on what, is, what feels good. Um, so uh, uh, think, thinking about it in terms of the user, um, uh, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit later when we talk about the, uh, establishing the problem. But for right now, what I want to talk about is that, that default, that how do you flip that default from, from, from no to yes. And one of the things I didn't hear, for surprisingly enough, was backwards compatibility, or like having to maintain this bad idea forever. Um, you know, how many times are, are, are you like, well, I would, I would love to do this, but we have all these decisions to make about it, and we don't know what's going to be the right one, and this, you know, five years from now, maybe we won't need this anymore. So you just have all this uncertainty that you won't do it. So what I say to that is this. Make being wrong cheap, because you're going to be wrong. Uh, and and, and uh, um, all of the other concerns that I heard can basically be fixed. They're all implementation detail. Um, and you can, and once you've implemented it, and, and, they're all, and basically they're bugs, or, or there are ways to work around API bloat, um, can all be fixed. But backwards compatibility cannot, if that's what you're concerned about. From a website perspective or, or a product perspective, maybe it's, oh god, we're going to lose all of our customers. Uh, and there are other ways to deal with that, like you know, A-B testing. So you can roll it out to maybe a tenth of your users and find out what happens. Um, so, but the important thing is make being wrong cheap, because you want to be able to try things and be wrong and learn from that and iterate. You have to iterate on that. Why? Well, because here is the best tactic for predicting the future. <laughs> Your prediction is wrong. Um, <clears throat> and, and kind of once you embrace that philosophy of, I am going to predict something about the future, it is going to be wrong, uh, and then I will try and fix it from there. But you can't have that, um, that resolution process, that iteration process, until you try it. Um, because otherwise, you are trying to predict the future by not trying things, and that just doesn't work out. Um, so Pro5i deals with this by having a backwards incompatibility plan. Um, absolutely guaranteed, every major release of Pro5i will be backwards incompatible with the previous version. Guaranteed. Because that's, that's the only definition of a major release. It has, it has a backwards <laughs> incompatibility. Um, but, but, but. Um, when you load it, you don't load Pro5i. You load a specific major version of Pro5i. So it's effectively like two different libraries. This would be like you know, GNOME 1, GNOME 2, GNOME 3, GNOME 4, or whatever else, except we planned it, planned it out from the, from the, from the start. Um, so there was a 0, there was a 1, now there's a 2. And uh, so they will work in, um, uh, as long as you scope them, they will work together in the same program. So the eight, while, while, so basically what this says is we can say, yes, the API is stable. Yes, we are going to change the API. Uh, because we've effectively forked the project at every, at every moment. But it means that being wrong is cheap. It means that we can experiment with things. When somebody says, hey, I want a method uh, to find out if, if there is a, um, if, there, if this string is in this list, a contains method. And my first impulse of that was, you can do that with grep. But then I, then I wrote it out, and I was like, well, this involves like, understanding list processing and understanding uh, a, functional, a little bit of functional programming. So I was like, all right, why not? Why not put it in? And if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, we can remove it in the next, next version. Um, not a big deal. So being wrong is cheap. And that means we can try things and have more fun instead of saying no. Second part is leaving room for expansion. Um, so, uh, from, again, from a, a programming perspective, programming API perspective, um, if you use positional uh, uh, parameters, 
great, here's two options, and now we've got three options, but oh wait, I don't, I don't want the second option, so I have to like still leave that in. And now it becomes expensive to add more and more options, and every, every option has to justify itself even more and more. You can't just be like, well, this option will be great, so let's just throw it in. You have to have a, you know, why do we need six options to this thing, seven options to this thing, because they're all always there, you're always paying for it. Whereas if you do it positionally, you can just, you know, use, use whatever you want. You only, you only pay for what you use. Um, Okay, so that's one section. I want to get on to, uh, how much time do I have left? Anybody know? What's that, 20 minutes? Okay, I think we're on track. Um, so we've talked about like kind of the solution side, but we haven't really talked about the problem. We talked about the answer and less about the problem. So, let's talk about the problems. Um, okay, joke, joke grenade. <laughs> Change slide, wait three seconds. Um, uh, so, how do you find the simple problem? Because very rarely does anybody present you with, you know, a nice simple statement like, how do I figure out this thing is a number? Usually they'll ask you something like, you know, I have an Excel file that's full of, you know, all this data. And I need to f add up the ones that are blah, 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 blah. And somewhere in there is the real question, which is, how do I figure out if this, if this string is a number, or looks like a number, or what kind of number it is? Um, so there are a bunch of different strategies to, to actually do this, to boil down, um, uh, to boil out the essence of, of the problem, to find the simple problem or problems within uh, a user's issue, bug report, whatever, however you might get it, feedback, um, so on and so forth. First, and the first one is this, to separate considering the problem from considering the solution. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just, I just had one today where I, um, I was helping a, a person on Stack Overflow. Helping people on Stack Overflow is great because if you find out how, uh, how, how terrible uh, a lot of the interfaces are because they, uh, users will ask these questions and you're like, I, mm, that's actually really hard to do. Question? Oh, uh, I think you're asking like, using, oh, using Stack Overflow, okay. Um, uh, so, I was helping somebody with a, a SQL parser, and they wanted to like make an Oracle dialect of it, and um, and I was trying to help them out, and I figured, I was like, well, it doesn't seem to be possible. Like you you can't actually extend the even though it has three different dialects, you can't write a new one, um, or it's extremely difficult. And uh, uh, so I was like, well, okay, I wrote my answer with like my three possible things and how they were blocked and everything else. Found a bug. And then I submitted the report to the, um, the, uh, uh, back to the library, and, uh, library author and said, hey, you might be interested to read this and see how much trouble we had. Um, and the answer I got back was, was like, oh, we don't, we're not, I don't, I don't want to put in the work to make it extensible, and if you want to do it, then you have to remember to do all this other work if you're doing it, and I don't understand why you're asking this question. Did, you, did I answer your question? I'm going to close this bug. <laughs> And it was, just, it was just like, oh God. Like, so you immediately went to the solution first. The solution is going to be hard, um, therefore I'm just going to pretend the problem doesn't exist. Um, just because you can't solve it doesn't mean it's not a problem. Um, so if you, if you consider the problem first without even bothering with the solution, uh, then you can first find out what is the problem that we're actually solving, right? You can't, you can't really solve the problem without uh, uh, knowing what it is. But um, there is an interesting knock-on effect to this, which is uh, there are people who are really good at analyzing problems. And there are people who are really good at writing solutions. Uh, and oftentimes, the people who are really good at writing the solutions are also the ones who are analyzing the problems and not so good at that. So what you can do is if you, if you separate these two things, a problem comes in and you distill the user report down to its problems, express them in the bug report or in the issue tracker or whatever else in terms of, all right, the user had this big long story and now what it really means is we need to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, implement this. And then leave it. You know, and that don't, like, the, the, the mistake at that point would be to go, oh, well, Y is really hard and we don't think we need X and, and Z will, who knows what, slow everything down. And then close the bug, it won't fix. 
You just leave it. Because then the people who are really good at solving problems can come along and pick it up and go, oh, I can do that, and then do it. And this happens in Profile all the time. Uh, it may take years <coughs> before somebody else picks it up, but we have had what were the uh, previously considered impossible problems solved um, by just mad geniuses. Um, impossible problems because, because of the way Perl is written more than anything else. Uh, so by distilling the problem, you can allow the people who are really good at implementing to just do the thing they're really good at. Um, right, here's the other thing. Find the problem and a bad solution. Uh, so uh, we, uh, this is a thing called the XY problem. Um, you say you want X, but you really want Y. And what this really means is, uh, is typically when, when somebody reports a bug or when somebody asks a question, what they're really saying is, how do I do this solution? And they won't tell you what their problem is. Uh, a, a classic one in Perl is, how do I make arrays take less memory? Um, which usually means they have taken a, a, a file with a billion lines in it and slurped it all into memory and then trying to do work on it. And it's like, well, all right, well, now you want to ask, how do I work on a file line at a time is the real problem. Um, so there is an art to discovering the real problem, to, 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 to realizing that it's an XY problem, uh, um, and then discovering through questioning the user, why do you want to do this, why do you want to do this, why do you want to do this? Why? Why? Um, so uh, why, 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 why? You kind of become like a little kid. Because uh, you've got to drill down into this. And this is actually a, a philosophy called the five whys. Uh, I, think it's part of, I think it's part of six sigma, which is part of seven epsilon, which is part of eight. No, I have no idea. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it's part of the five whys. I think it's part of six sigma. Um, and the five whys, I think, came out of Toyota or Honda. I'm not sure. Toyota. Um, the five whys is just that. It, it's a way to get down to the root problem. Why did this happen? Why did the server go down? Well, the server went down because the power went out. Why did the power go out? Well, the power went out because the generator didn't kick in. Why didn't the generator kick in? It wasn't plugged in. Okay. Why? why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Good point. Why do I plug in a generator? <laughs> you get down to the root of the problem, right? Oh, it's, it's actually a... Uh, 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 there's, there's, there's no generator here. It's just, it's just a wire going into a box and going out the other side. <laughs> um, terrible example, sorry. Uh, um, but the five whys is, is, a, is a, again, a, a philosophy of dealing with problems that gets you down to the root of the problem, then you can now deal with it. Um, I think there's a saying, make, maybe coming out of the same philosophy, is um, there, are no, there, are no, there are no failures of people, there are only failures of procedure. Um, and that's another, another way to kind of... Um, take responsibility for the problem uh, organizationally as opposed to, you know, blaming somebody when it comes down to um, why did something go wrong. Um, another great uh, uh, thing is this book called Getting to Yes. And um, it kind of looks like a, a, a skeevy business negotiation book, but it's actually um, a bunch of Harvard business folks looked into how negotiation is done and kind of came up with a new way to do it. And this book's been around for a while. But they, and they like, kind of boil it down to like five things. And the one that's relevant here is that they talk about um, this, interests over positions. Um, and, and the idea is when people argue, when people negotiate, or when people report bugs and feedback, they're all about their position. I want this. You, sh you should do this. It should work like this. Um, and what you really want to know is their values and interests. What are they actually trying to express? What do they really want behind the scenes? Um, uh, and, and, and go for that. Because positions, you can't really negotiate positions. You can't really, uh, you know, people giving in, or in the case of uh, feedback and bug reports, they're basically the, the bad solutions that you want to, you don't want to actually implement that. So you need to find what the real problem is behind the scenes. Um, rather than completely butcher the book, uh, I will just say that um, you should really have a look at that. Uh, and it's an excellent book for everything else. So kind of, I wish everybody in the internet read it. We would have so much better arguments. I don't want to say fewer, but better. Um, uh, so another way of, of, of taking apart the problem, and this gets back into the optimism point of view, is, is the what would Star Trek do? Do I have like five minutes left? Damn. 
a 10. Great. Uh, what would Star Trek do? Um, which is the, uh, the sort of like, what would, what would happen if the computer wasn't a, was magical? Um, if I could just say, you know, computer uh, tea or very hot. Um, or coffee. Um, and it's funny because we're at the point where we can actually do this. We have so much, there's so much computing hardware. I think there's more computing power in my phone than there was in my laptop five years ago, uh, which is just astonishing. Um, and the voice recognition is getting to the point, geolocation is getting, is getting there, um, uh, all sorts of like sp uh, speech and pattern recognition is getting there, that we have the Star Trek device. Anybody here use Google Now? Raise your hand, Google Now, a few. Yeah, that's the Star Trek, that's what would Star Trek do. Google Now, if people don't know, reads your mail and it just tells you things like, well, you have to, you have to leave for Open Source Bridge now. I know where you are, I know where it is, I know you're going because I figured it out from reading your email. So I'm going to tell you that, and I know you don't own a car, <laughs> uh, <laughs> by watching patterns of, trans, of, of transit in the past and what you've asked me, because Google knows everything. Um, so I'm going to say, hey, you better leave to Open Source Bridge now. Uh, it's going to take you half an hour to get there. Here's, here's directions. Um, you know, it'll tell you this like 45 minutes before the event. Um, it is amazing. It's a little creepy. Um, but if you, if you want to, you know, at least you, you know, Google is gathering everything. This is at least a useful um, out, outlet of it. And it is magical, and it is, in some ways, it is, it is simple from the user perspective. In fact, it's so simple it has no interface. It just tells you what you should be doing right now. Um, uh, but the, the implementation is immensely complex and immensely hard and immensely difficult, you know, to, to be nigh impossible five years ago. Um, Does it do relationships yet, or just? I have no idea. No idea. I, I find it too creepy to, to use. Wow. Yeah, because it's basically using the same stuff that AdSense uses, just at a higher resolution. Um, TripIt, I love this because I travel a lot. TripIt um, is the first travel application that's actually useful. What you do with TripIt is you sign up and then you, you, know, you, get your, you, you book your flights with whatever, you book your hotels, you book your car, and you get all those email receipts, right? And then you just forward it to TripIt and it figures it out. And it gives you this nice itinerary. Um, it figures out what flights are on. It gives you your confirmation numbers. It'll tell you. It'll give you directions to your hotel. Uh, it'll figure out when you're checking in and when you're checking out. It is amazing. Um, and I like it better because I can, I can control what I give it than Google now. It's, it's much less creepy that way. Um, but this is Star Trek technology. I, uh, like this, is, this is amazing that I can just hand it. Like, I think I've had it screw up once in a blue moon and it, uh, of not being able to parse something I give it. Um, and this is, again, you know, almost zero interface. Um, I don't, I'm not entirely certain how you would express the simple question here. Sometimes the simple question is, just take care of it. Um, just make this problem go away. And, and it kind of does it. But it's deceptively simple because you know, five years ago, or before this came about, would, would that be the way that we think to solve it or even the problem that we had to solve, which is essentially parsing email. Right? That's, what, that's what it's really solving under the hood, is parsing email. Um, and, then, and then giving it to you in a nice, in a nice pretty presentation. Um, and this, this, is, this is all relative because, you know, uh, people who were programming uh, 20, as little as 20 years ago, you know, this is, this is how we used to do programming in C because memory allocation was really, really important because we, you know, had to work on, what's, what's the smallest amount of memory anybody's used here? Marcus. Um, Geez, all right, you win. <laughs> On what? What? Uh, embedded hardware back oh. in the 70s. Wow. So that beats my VIC-20, by certainly. So, this, so that, like, this is magical. This was magical 20 years ago or 15 years ago, whenever dynamic languages started coming out. The fact that, like, this memory allocation was done for you. So I need to really speed up because I'm running out of time. Shoot. Um, one of the problems to deal with is in any, give, in any given uh, situation is a step zero problem which is to say, um, earlier I said that easy is relative. So the step zero problem, and simple can be built on complex prerequisites. So step zero says, all right, um, if you know nothing about my product, what do you have to do? What are the prerequisites to getting to now use these simple answers that I have provided? Um, uh, there can be 85 great, use, great reasons to use your thing, but one missing prereq or one critical bug <laughs> or one missing piece of documentation, and they can't use it. 
So step zero is extremely important. Step zero, if, if you don't get to step zero, you fail. Um, it doesn't matter how great your thing is. One of the simple tests, what does it take to get to Hello World? And, and what does it take to get to Hello World, from Hello World from a dead stop? As in, I have just installed, a com and I have just picked up my new computer. It's on operating system of choice. What are the steps I have to go through to get my thing to run? You know, do I need to install a compiler? Do I need to install an editor? What's an editor? What's a text editor? I mean, we all know. But I, I don't know how many people here actually know, have used a text editor, but a lot of people haven't. Um, and if you don't deal with this, people just won't use their product. Um, some of the worst code-wise Perl tutorials out there are some of the best because they uh, deal with the step zero problem. Um, there was a, a series that some of the trainers were making fun of, and I looked at it. It was, it was a series of videos on YouTube. Now, first off, it's video, which just like that gathers a whole audience that will not look at a wall of text or a web page. Um, he was doing it on Windows, so that's a that's like 50% of the Perl audience that gets dropped on the floor by all because Perl is very Unix centric. And um, he started out by talking about how to how to get Perl, how to install Perl, how to get a text editor, what a text editor is, and how to get the Hello World. And he immediately gathered a huge audience just by that. Didn't matter what the rest of the code, what the code was like. Um, he immediately gathered a huge audience that could not use any other Perl tutorials because they did not address step zero. Um, uh, one of the other fun things to, to see about step zero is to um, watch somebody totally unfamiliar with your thing trying it. Uh, watch how they try and find information. Watch, uh, uh, note down what questions they ask, note down where they get stuck, and note uh, at what point their eyes glaze over. You know, how, how long are they willing to, to, do, to, to, to uh, work on this thing before they, before they give up? And don't answer the questions. Um, and you have to kind of either train your user or be very, very good at answering questions with questions um, to deal with this, uh, to do this properly, but it can be really, really, really handy. Um, about three minutes left, good, because I just got to the flying camel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so there, are, there are issues with this philosophy um, of, of simple things should be simple. You can't always make things sim uh, uh, simple and easy and convenient and correct and efficient. Sometimes when you make a camel fly, you just can't get rid of the crane. The crane is going to be there. Um, so the question is, well, do you, what do you do about the crane? Um, and it's, it's great to hide the crane as much as possible, but if you can't, and the crane is like, you know, the, the, the thing that's the scaffolding, the, 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 the magic behind the curtain that you can't entirely get rid of. I'll, I'll explain a bit. Um, if you try and pretend it isn't there, sometimes the user won't get the information that they need. Um, so for example, in, in most uh, dynamic languages, this is how you sort a list. Hey, it's just a function call on this list. Great. So, um, so just one thing. Great. Must be, this must be okay. I'm going to put this thing inside a loop. Why is my code slow? Um, it's because this is actually doing a whole lot of work. That sort operation is doing a whole lot of work, but it's deceptively simple. It, 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 it hides the fact that there's actually a big loop going on in there. So as, that, as that, the size of that list increases, it will slow down exponentially, and you need to do that. Um, so that's sort is hiding the crane um, too well. If you look at the document, and if you look at the documentation of sort, there's really no, not a lot of discussion about the, um, the efficiencies of the sort function. So from a, somebody who doesn't know algorithm, algorithms, sort just looks like any other function, right? Why should it be slower? Why should it slow down? What's wrong with putting it inside a loop? Um, Marcus asked if, if Perl 6 had, had is prime function. It does. And one of the arguments against it was, well, what if somebody has a huge number and they ask if it's prime, it might take all week. <laughs> and it's kind of like, well, they're not going to, if, if like, that problem is not going to go away. If they write their own prime implementation, it's not suddenly going to not take a week if they ask what, you know, prime is of however, however high they get. Um, so, so to talk about the crane. Um, uh, in, the, in the documentation, explain uh, as, as much as you need about the algorithm, the complexity of this. Um, and you, know, you don't need to go into big O notation, but you do at least need to explain that you know, as the number gets bigger, the, the runtime will get slower and slower and slower and slower. The nice thing about implementing it in the language is that it can, for example, cache it. 
Uh, whereas, you know, random implementation might not think to do that. It can, it can collectively make it better and better and better and faster and faster and faster and less and less bugs and everything else. Whereas if you just said, no, that's too slow or it's, you know, too complex to explain to the user or they're going to use it wrong um, or somebody was like, you know, what do you do if they call it on a, on a big num instead of a regular integer and all sorts of things. That just means that people are just going to implement it nine million different ways and all subtly wrong. And you're going to get no, no collective work done on it. If you're caching it, but you're just typing a different crane, it's not memory usage. Yeah, but it's tiny. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 I mean, that, that's a philosophical thing. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, how many times you're calling is prime. Um, uh, but, but, but you can talk about that. You can be like, it caches, so if you call it twice, it'll, it'll go ahead. But you kind of decide whether or not that's an implementation issue or not that should be told. There's a, a trick I didn't talk about in here, which is tell the user as little as possible. Sorry, make as few promises as possible in your, in your, in your API. Um, don't say, you know, this, if, you can, if you can get away with not saying, saying this thing caches, then I would just not say it. I would just say, what do you know? It performs faster. That's a great uh, question. Oh, okay. I need to wrap it up. Okay, um, I want to talk about some quick stop words. Um, uh, if you if you have this thing, these these words in your conversation, um, stop because uh, and think about what you just said. Obvious. Um, yeah, uh, obvious is like easy. It's all relative. And if you ever say obviously you do this or it's obvious that it's not, um, just assume it's not. Just 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 and 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 if you if you have this in your in your reply to a bug, remove it. Just just do this. Is sort of a like is like it's obvious or it's so oh god it's so simple just remove it <laughs> easy <laughs> um, easy and simple usually abused get rid of them if somebody if a programmer ever tells you that something is simple or easy run um, unless they're giving it a talk about it um, elegant is simple is, is sort sort of this, all these things are you typically abused and they don't really mean anything elegant doesn't really mean anything like what what are they actually trying to express under this you can't you can't argue whether a piece of code is more or less elegant. You might say it's shorter or even easier to maintain is, is difficult to get to wrap your brain around. And clever. Anything which is clever is sort of the antithesis of, of simple and easy. Um, OK, uh, so I have a few things to see also to review. Um, I think I mentioned Doors, uh, which is the uh, Design of Everyday Things book, is the, the, the book about doors. This is sort of uh, uh, human interface design 101. Um, it is also great therapy. Uh, basically, part, Donald Normans is saying it's not your fault. Uh, if, you, if, you can't, if, you do, if, you, if you can't use a thing, a teapot, a door handle, um, it's not your fault. It's the designer's fault. It was a bad design. Uh, and a lot of the ideas in here apply to how do you make things simpler, how do you make things, especially how do you make things easier um, um, by taking advantage of, I mentioned natural mappings earlier, affordances, and so on and so forth. Read it. It's great. Um, I mentioned um, getting to yes, and in particular, the idea of um, focusing on interests and values and not positions. Um, Rich Hickey's talk about Simple Made Easy, uh, which kind of uh, takes this idea from a different, more formal approach. Um, this is a pony who is the epitome of sloth, because I thought I wouldn't have any ponies in this talk, and somebody mentioned sloths were a thing. So uh, I talked about the five whys uh, uh, philosophy and profile I. So thank you very much. Uh, and are there any questions? I hope this would be more of a discussion, but I just ran my mouth the whole time. Marcus. So, oh, yeah, I, I thought last. No, okay. Jesse. Okay. Uh, so Ruby. Yeah, uh, heard of it. Has that move fast and break things, and we'll just add stuff to string and remove it in the next version. That's what the backwards incompatibility plan is for. So that, that's, why, that's why you need to make, that's, that's just breaking, breaking stuff without regard to upgrade. So that's why you need to make, be, make being wrong cheap, whereas Ruby has not done that. But you, as, as, for you, as a developer for your project, or for all bye-bye, mm -hmm. how much time do you spend keeping? Oh, we, we haven't, two is the, is, a, is the first version that's had any, any, little, any amount of adoption. So okay. we'll find out when we go to three. Okay. Um, but we don't, we don't. We don't rev that fast. Yes, so will I. Uh, because the crane is going to stick through a lot. Trying to make these things lexical and package scoped and make sure they don't collide with each other yeah. is going to be interesting. 
Um, but uh, speaking of Ruby, so there's, a, there's another uh, way that this has gone horribly, horribly wrong is PHP. Uh, in the sense of let's just the eight, let's just throw 8,000 functions in together and they all look different and there's no uni unifying anything about it and they all act different and they they were wrong but they can't change it now um, and so now that they've figured out what is what is they're trying learning what more and more is what is right they can't undo what they had done previously with you know and so there's like, there's like a trail of particularly like bad database interfaces or array interfaces or string interfaces that are, that are just stuck in Ruby forever and ever and ever. And same thing in Perl 5. Marcus. So on the is prime thing, there's an alternate implementation you could do that would not have um, bad time performance, would not have bad space performance. Talk to the network? Only just make you throw up in your mouth. <laughs> um, which is that you can do probabilis probabilistic primality tests, and you can answer and just be wrong. <laughs> 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 So you're like, the larger, so the larger the number, the higher the probability it's not prime. Well, yeah, but the, 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 the chance that the hardware would have failed anyway in computing the whole thing, it's better. Yeah. It's not higher reliability. And faster. Yeah. Well, it sounds like this is nope, nope, nope. We're going to hold on that one. <laughs> that would de de totally derailing the talk. Uh, any, any other questions? I'm trolling. I should have said that. No, I think it's perfectly effective. Yeah. <laughs> any other questions? Excellent. I feel well, there, there, no, there, no, nobody else had questions. Anyone else have questions before before we let Marcus and, and Nick take over? <laughs> Anyone else have comments? Anyone think it's? Yes. Oh, thank. No. Okay. You are released. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yay.